Hi everyone, I'm Barnabé Mono. I'm a researcher at the Robust Incentive Group, RIG. Today I want to talk about proposer builder separation. More specifically, I want to really get into why this is a good idea and why we're getting to this point, because I think this is maybe the most uh, misunderstood thing about it. And then I'll give you some questions to think about uh, at the end. To understand PBS, we have to kind of understand the history of block space. Ethereum is a protocol that sells block space, but it's also a protocol that secures a lot of digital assets that have value. And it means that people who interact with the protocol, <coughs> they're going to adapt their behavior, uh, develop market structures that allow them to make better use of that block space. Some of these market structures, they're out of protocol but when they become systemic, it might be a good idea to, to be proactive and to move these, these things into protocol. And that's kind of a long story of, of, of PBS. We've done it before. For instance, with EIP-1559, we decided that the ad hoc uh, market that we had was not as optimal as it could be, and so we moved some things into the protocol, such as pricing, uh, and we've seen that you know, it provides a net reduction in complexity, and, and we in fact have many other features uh, that come from that. So let's get into why this market is valuable. So to understand the market, I, I want to kind of understand what's on the other side, so the, the user side, and what they get out of using Ethereum. So you can think of the user as having some sort of utility for sending their transaction, right? They have a willingness to pay, they, they have some money that they want to expend, and if you're an economist, a bit like me, you can draw this demand curve, right? And that's neat. With VIP1559, you target the price that equalizes supply and demand. It's all good. Most of the time, it is all good, but sometimes this fails. So this, this neat uh, little curve is actually not what's happening because transactions, they can revert. So things can happen to your transaction that you don't really expect, and then you might not have the same value for these different outcomes. For instance, if you try to mint an NFT while everybody else is minting it, and if you come too late and the contract has run out, you'll find blocks that are just filled with reverted transactions from people who couldn't mint uh, the NFT in time. And so that gives us a clue that the utility of a transaction is actually very much state dependent, okay? We know when, when a user publishes their transaction in, in, the, in the transaction pool, we know their intent. We know what they want to do. I want to swap some tokens. I want to mint an NFT. And this intent that is public means that people can see it and they can try to take advantage of it, okay? So we know that as front running or back running. Uh, basically, they're incentives to exploit either the state that immediately precedes your transaction or the state that immediately succeeds it. This has led to the well-known phenomenon of priority gas auctions. This is one plot uh, from the Flash Boys paper that shows bidding bots competing against one another to be the first uh, to exploit the transaction. And this is kind of bad, right? The problem of PGAs, they have a lot of negative externalities because the bots are replacing transactions a lot. Uh, they kind of bloat the transaction pool uh, because multiple bots are competing for the same opportunity only one of them eventually wins and, 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 and makes it into the block, but all the others are also in the block but reverted, so this is kind of a waste of valuable uh, block space. And pre-1559, in fact, they could even be so dramatically increasing their bids that suddenly the oracles would go haywire and tell you that the gas price was really, uh, really high. But what I want to get um, at is that we can't think of transaction as atomic any longer. We have to think of them as valuable not just for the fact that they are included in the block, but also valuable depending on their position. And position is really just another way of saying they are valuable because of the state that they act upon. And so how can we think about this? So we think of them as bundles now. So for instance, let's say there's a transaction which is an Oracle update, for instance, a price feed. And I can exploit that and make a lot of money if I can get my transaction right after the Oracle update. And so the utility for me to send this bundle where my transaction immediately succeeds um, the, the Oracle update is very high. But if somebody else 
sends their transaction in the meantime and is able to, to get between me and the price update, then my utility is actually very low. So if we want to let users bid on these atomic bundles, so saying, allowing me to say, I, I really only care if my transaction gets in right after this one, it opens the space for a very complicated auction mechanism. We call them combinatorial auctions. It's, it's a kind of auction where I don't really care only about the item, but I care about bundles of, of items. This leads to an explosion in complexity, and this is why we have searchers who are specialized in finding these opportunities and finding these profitable bundles. And so the searchers, they come at, at, at the end, and they say, I would like to bid, like this bundle is valuable for like a million to me, so let me give you, the block producer, 900,000 so that you, you include my bundle, okay? But that's a very complicated market to, to organize. Pre-merge, in proof of work. Um, how this market was organized is basically out of protocol. When the searchers send these bundles, they literally leak alpha. They tell you what's a nice economic opportunity. And so there's a risk that by doing that, the miner that they send the bundle to exploits the opportunity instead of them. So that's a problem. We call that pre-confirmation privacy. And the solution today is Flashbots is basically whitelisting a set of trustworthy miners uh, that won't steal the bundle. And so they, they share these bundles only with miners um, in that list. It's not great, but today most miners are mining as part of mining pools. So by sending the bundles only to a few key players, uh, they can kind of organize this market. The mining pools are very identifiable, so they can also, the users of these pools can apply pressure to say, you know, Flashbots is sending you juicy bundles. Please share the rewards with us who are mining for your pool. But it's still a little brittle. It gets even worse in proof of stake. So the, the one nice thing about proof of stake is that we have this long tail of solo validators. The reward variance is much lower. You can get paid every epoch. And so there's not as much uh, economic incentive to join a staking pool. But the problem is that we can't whitelist everyone, right? If you're a solo validator, you only propose a block every so often, which means that you can't really be trusted by, by, a, by a third party. If we only share the alpha, the juicy bundles uh, with trusted validators, we'll quickly get to a point where the system becomes very economically centralized, as solo validators would be discouraged, and then they would join staking pools. One solution to that is to share the bundle header, so do blind proposing. You commit to including a bundle, but you don't know what it is. So you commit as a proposer to, to include that bundle. But now the problem with that, is it's not really compatible with searchers doing only one part of the block, let's say the top part, and the proposer then doing the other part. If you commit to something that you don't know what it is, maybe you're including duplicated transaction at the bottom. If you commit to it and then it's revealed to you, the proposer then also has time to extract some MEV, right? There's maybe a two-step process where you, you see the bundle, you know what's inside, and now you have a few more seconds to, to do more extraction. And this is kind of incompatible with making proposers as naive as possible. If they have to become sophisticated and if they have to think about these things, this is going to centralize and it's going to lead to the bad outcomes um, that I described previously. And so the solution here, is to extend the auction, say it's no longer bundles, now people can give us whole blocks, okay? And the proposer can simply decide which block to, to, to choose. So the builders are now the ones who are proposing these blocks. A few desiderata <coughs> that we want out of this system. So the first one is basically that proposers can't steal the builder data, right? If they see a juicy opportunity, they have to commit to not uh, stealing it. We have to ensure that the two parties in this market, the builders and the proposer, uh, they can't grief each other. For instance, the builder could promise to pay a very high amount and then never reveal the payload, making the block invalid, which means that the proposer has missed the opportunity to, to choose uh, a different block. And then proposers shouldn't also be able to grieve builders by promising that they will include the builder, getting paid, and then not including the bundle, which leads the builder to, to not receiving um, that money. 
There is a design to do this post-merge, which was proposed by Flashbots. And I just want to run through the, the, the steps. It's, it's fairly simple, but it involves another party, which is called the relay. So the relay sits between the builders and the proposers. The builders first create these blocks, and they, they evaluate how valuable the blocks are to them. They say, I promise to pay the proposer. Uh, this amount if I am included. And so the relay collects these blocks and these bids, after which it sends that to the proposer. Only the block headers so that the proposer cannot see the content of the bundles. So the proposer is expected to choose the bid that would give them uh, the, the, most, the most money. They sign that bid. Again, it's just a header, so they don't know what's inside. And once the relay receives the signed bid, they can basically make the block on behalf of the proposer, so the full beacon block with the execution payload. At this point, the relay could just gossip the block, and the proposer couldn't submit something else at risk of being slashed. This works, but we have now this relay, which is outside of the protocol and which is, has to be a little bit trusted. So there's ways to decentralize that relay, but if you have a liveness failure, um, you, you need some sort of fallback mechanism to tell you that, okay, this relay is offline, so now you need to make the blocks uh, yourself as the proposer. It, it's a little tricky to decide when to activate it, and it means that we have to rely on this outside party. And so we get to PBS. This was a, a long, winded way to, to get to there, but, but, it, but I've, I really feel this is the, the, the way to, to, to think about it. So now we're trying to make, move to the protocol, the, the parts of the system that we believe are systemic uh, risk to, to this market. And so in protocol, organize this market for, for blocks between builders and proposers. At the moment, there's a design that seems the most workable. It's called the two-slot design. So in the first slot, the proposer sends a beacon block that contains the bid that they plan to include in their block. And in the second slot, the builder is expected to reveal the exec block body uh, that they constructed. The same kind of fork choice is applied to both blocks so that if the body is missing, the proposer still gets paid because they've done their part and sent the block in slot one. And if the builder doesn't reveal, um, oh, and if the proposer doesn't commit to something, the builder doesn't reveal their block, so that then they can't have their contents uh, stolen. There are many open questions, and I hope you can help us figure some of them out uh, at, the, at the session later. Uh, the first one is, you know, it's a, it's a big change. It, it involves a lot of different actors. Is the mechanism incentive compatible? Is everyone incentivized to do their role properly? For instance, would a builder prefer to enter into agreements with a proposer? Uh, what about the block release timing? Like if you can game that, you can get more MEV or, or more bundles in. Are there any other deviation? Uh, a second thing is, is the mechanism live? So to, to make this mechanism work, we might need an, actually a, a small change to the fork choice called block slot, where, which allows people to vote for saying that they haven't seen uh, something. That, however, imposes a latency constraint because now you have to say, well, eight seconds have elapsed, I haven't seen something, I vote that it's not there. Uh, but, but, but this latency constraint can maybe be attenuated with something like a, like a back-off scheme so that whenever the latency on the network gets too big, we just increase that, uh, that time that we give us to, to see something um, valuable. And then is there better, right? It's, we, I think we're still early into the research stage, but, and there may be different designs that would uh, do the job as well. There's a proposal by Vitalik, for instance, that looks more like if you were using the attesters as the relay um, in, in this Flashbots design. So, um, yeah, different design might exist. And then more questions, right? If we have a single builder, because it might be the case that it's such a difficult activity that it centralizes around one builder doing the blocks for everyone. In that case, how can we guarantee that the protocol is still resistant to censorship? It becomes much less costly for the single builder to, to not uh, include a transaction. So an ID by Francesco, CR list might be a way to force builders to, to include transactions that are censored, but there's a lot of analysis to, to do there uh, as well. 
And generally, I think a nice question would be to try and think through what will the market look like? Are we going to end up with a single builder? Uh, are we going to have a fierce competition of builders and a very wide market of searchers on the other side? Um, this is, in my opinion, quite unexplored and, and it could give us uh, a nice insight to, to do this design properly. So join our workshop at 11 a.m. in Expo this room. Thank you. <laughs>